Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome to another episode of Time for Coffee. I am so excited you press play. And trust me, if you're interested in music and want to know how to break into this industry, either as an artist or behind the scenes as a producer, then you will be too. Because my next guest is the CEO of an international media and music firm that has experience on every continent in television, music, live events, artist strategy, film, radio, print, and digital media. But before I introduce you to Jeff Pollock, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you an exclusive look inside the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. And it is so easy to do. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my friends, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Jeff Pollock, the CEO of the Pollock Media Group. After starting out in radio, Jeff launched his own company almost 40 years ago in 1980, which has grown to include diverse clients such as MTV, VH1, CMT, Spotify, SFX Entertainment, Delta Airlines, and the Smithsonian. As a producer, Jeff has participated in some of the largest music and charity events of the last couple of decades, including Live Aid and Live 8 and the 70th anniversary of the Apollo Theater and so much more. As a music supervisor, he's worked on over 30 films, five of which received Academy Award nominations for Best Original Song. And one of them actually went on to win an Academy Award, The Weary Kind, from the movie Crazy Heart, starring Jeff Bridges. Some of Jeff's current projects include producing a new two-part documentary entitled Laurel Canyon, which is expected to premiere on Epics in early 2020, and the documentary The Gift, The Journey of Johnny Cash, which premiered in November 2019. Jeff is also an executive producer on a super wonderful new Netflix hip-hop competition called Rhythm and Flow featuring Cardi B, Tip, and Chance the Rapper. And that premiered on Netflix also in 2019. Jeff, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am ready for you, Andrea. Okay, I'm guessing you have to be caffeinated. You've got so many projects going on. Yes, I'm very lucky. You know, I've had a lot of opportunities to do various things across the entertainment spectrum the last 40 years, and it keeps shifting and changing. And the challenge is to kind of do my best to keep up with the technology changes and just the the way the industry shifts. And fortunately, I've been able to, you know, reappear (laughs) every decade in something brand new. That's amazing. And that's half the battle, right? Being able to continue to kind of pivot and shift and, and evolve over the course of your career, no matter what the industry is. So let's jump into our 10 espresso shots featuring your industry, the music industry writ large. What entry-level jobs, Jeff, are available to young people who want to break into this field behind the scenes? It's interesting. I've done quite a few talks at Yale as as well as other colleges, and students will ask the same question. I mean, they generally show up to hear some cool inside stories, but at the end of the day, they're looking for a way in. And that's the way it was for me when I started. I started in college radio as a college DJ. You didn't get paid, but you got to play music for other people and pontificate on the air and meet girls that way. So that was always good. But I think For anybody who wants to get started, you have to identify what part of the business excites you. Is it working at a streaming platform? Is it working at a label? Is it working in artist management? Is it working at a radio station? 
all of these things are sort of important because once you decide what you want to do, then you just start showing up. You just go and you apply and you work for free, even though some states don't allow you to do that anymore because of the internship issues. But there's no better way than getting an entry point position. And I always tell people, make yourself invaluable. Make yourself so so crucial to the, the process that somebody turns around and says, well, you know, maybe we ought to hire that person. I just think that there's nothing more important to anybody who is young wanting to getting in the business is persistence. I had a conversation with Ed Sheeran backstage in Boston a couple of years ago, and he was telling my son, who wants to be a musician, and he would say, well, how did you get started? And Ed said, you just go out and play. You play everywhere. You get better and better. You get more comfortable playing in front of people. And then finally, you get good. And so I always say to people, if you really want to do something, you can do it. I really am confident. I grew up in a a yes family, not a no family. And it's really important for someone who says, look, there's nothing I'd rather do than be around music. And that's great. Follow your passion and just be super aggressive. And even if you don't know anyone in the business, people will take heed of you if you're showing a a real intent to get involved. Okay. So what about a useful skill or skills? And I would put this in the frame of hard skills and soft skills that you look for, Jeff, in the young people that you hire. Well, hard skills are You'll do anything you're asked to do and more when it comes to achieving a task. You won't take no for an answer. You'll actually not have to come back to me each time and say, well, what do I do if they say this? You end up being entrepreneurial in your way of saying, well, you know what? I don't have to go back and ask Jeff. Maybe maybe I should pr- approach it this way or that way. So I, I really look for people who are problem solvers, You do need the information essentially first, but show some initiative, really show some creativity when it comes to doing what someone asks you to do, because you're you're really judged in those early days by how you tackle those situations. So it's persistence, it's being creative, it's showing initiative and work late. Show your work ethic is there. Be there late after everybody's gone and even show up and do something that nobody asked you to do and prepare a paper or prepare a plan about something that's new and that could affect the company. That's the kind of people who end up getting jobs hired from volunteers to to paying gigs. Absolutely fantastic advice. What about life experiences? And I'm guessing in this field, There are all kinds of experiences that you can have outside the classroom. What do you think, Jeff, in your experience, are the most useful ones for someone starting out in this field? Well, I know you referenced earlier about soft skills. And if we mean by soft skills, people skills, that is fundamentally one of the most important things you need to have because people want to be around people that are fun, that make them smile are easygoing. If you're a prima donna, if you're a diva, you are not going to have a lot of success when it comes to promotion because somebody will always get promoted over you if you're easygoing or you just get along with people. It's an absolutely crucial part of being successful in any business and certainly the music and the radio, everybody likes to be around people that are fun to be with. So I can't overemphasize that. You hear it, it's a cliche, but it, it, it means something for your entire working life. And are you suggesting that there are prima donnas in the producing side, the behind the scenes world that you work in? Oh, sure. And there are prima donnas who are entry level employees. I mean, there are people who think that they know everything and that they are, they don't really need to know what's going to happen. A lot of the early techies were like that, like, oh, Jesus, this guy has, he must be 50. What would he know? I'm 25. I know more than he does. 
obviously haven't read the Mark Twain quote. The situation is, of course, there's prima donnas in all levels of it, but you can't afford to be one if you're if you're entering the business. You even can't afford it later on when you're successful because you're only as good as your last film, your last record, your last your TV show, because there's always somebody better, smarter, hipper, more beautiful, more handsome. So I think people really need to understand that if you're super self-involved, then you're going to be less interesting to people you work with. Oh, wow. That is a really important wake-up call. Is someone's major a deciding factor to get into your profession? And if so, are there certain majors that would be better to have? Well, I didn't finish college. I went and got a job at a commercial radio station in Denver where I was going to school. And I said, well, any reason for me to stay in college when what I want to do is be around music? And I said, no. So I think an education is incredibly important. I think you always go back and rely on it, whether you go to an Ivy League or whether you go to a really good state school. I think that these days the business does pay attention to your education, but the idea of you could make a cool new TV show because you got a degree in engineering is not true. And that you went to Yale Law School and and you can sign a new band like 21 Pilots because you've got the ears. I mean, that's that's a disconnect. Sometimes you have both, but there are not a ton of people that I have met that in my business that have had an elite education, to be honest. I think they're educated. I think the education they got was from experience from the street or self-education. A lot of people are incredibly smart and incredibly informed and well-read that did not finish college. It's not a miracle that people like David Bowie or Bono or Mick Jagger or people like that, Kanye West, are brilliant. But I don't know where they went to school. I know that most of the people that I know started school, they were in art school, or they did something creative, and they found something they wanted to do, and they pursued it. So yeah, I find college is a place where you get stimulated, and you meet people, and maybe you're lucky enough to find what you want to do when you're in that environment of amazing people from all over the place. You know, it just really depends on what you're going to do. If you're going to get in the sports business, which is obviously the entertainment business, I think a degree is very important. And I think if you want to work at a record label in the business side, I think having a business degree or economics degree or something like that, a law degree helps a lot. So it really depends on whether you are a creative head or a business head. And sometimes somebody can be both. It doesn't mean you can't. But in my particular case, I was able to be near music, which is what I wanted to do and was lucky enough. And at that point, I said to myself, well, what am I doing here? (laughs) Get a job. Well, that sounds like wonderful advice. What about getting a graduate school degree? And this is less so for the entry level positions, more so for down the line. If somebody wants to be an executive at a music label or start their own company the way that you did, do you think that a grad school degree is something that they should think about? And if so, what are the most useful ones to have? Well, I think once you're successful in the business and you go back to school, say you go to HBS, you go back to Harvard Business School and somebody says the record label or the company will pay for you to go. That's nice. It's bragging rights. But grad school and the music business, grad school and the film business, grad school and TV business, not sure I see a connection there. Hey, that's great to know. Jeff, what is the best part for you? of being in this profession? Being near the music, being in a place like I was. I remember in July 5th, 2005, being on the grass at Wembley Stadium, watching 
U2 and Paul McCartney rehearsing Sgt. Pepper's with 20 people while they're going through rehearsal and having been one of the producers on that event and saying to myself, how is it possible that I'm sitting here watching this happen, having been involved in an event this amazing? How did I get so lucky? And it's being at a particular place, being in the studio with U2 and Green Day when they were recording together at Abbey Road, being at a, at a place where you never thought you could participate. You never thought that you would actually be a witness to the creative process like that, or even be a participant when somebody says, well, what'd you think of that? Or which mix do you like the best? So it always would come down to the music and being able to meet somebody who influenced your life in a significant way that made music that changed a lot of things for you. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can only imagine how many times you've pinched yourself over the years. Yes. <laughs> there was a time when I was in a room with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and myself, and I came home. I called my wife and I said, what was I doing in the room? There was one person that didn't belong in that meeting, and uh, it was me. So it was just, you, you end up finding sometimes that you just go along with what you're lucky enough to do, and you don't really think about it until later that you had that kind of opportunity. Well, my hope is that our young listeners who want to build a career in this industry get to have some of those amazing moments in the years to come. They can do it. I mean, here's the thing is that to think that you can't at some point dream about being in the studio with Kendrick Lamar or J. Cole or Chance the Rapper is somebody who might influence you in terms of his whether it's his politics or his, you know, his charity work in Chicago or things, those are all possible. That's an important word when you're thinking about your future, because it should not feel like these aspirations can't be fulfilled. Anybody can do anything. That's the kind of family I grew up in, and I've always appreciated it. My mother and father showed me by what they did that anybody could do something if they really wanted to work. And, and, and the other thing we didn't talk about, Andrew, which is super important, I should have referenced this when you talked about some of the attributes of somebody, taking risks is super important because you will be amazed that once in a while it actually works out. Sometimes something that you do comes to pass and being able to to accept a no and to accept a rejection is something you have to learn all your life you have to do. You have to realize that you're going to get no's every week. You're going to get rejection. People are going to say, no, I don't want to do that. And you have to say, okay, well, fair enough. And that ability to bounce back, it goes back to what we talked about, persistence and rejection and everything else. You have to put yourself in a position where you're actually risking enough to get rejected. You have to be able to do things because I can't tell you how many important moments in my creative life where I took a shot, you know, and I didn't know what was going to happen. But I always said to myself, well, the worst they can do is say no. Yes. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think if we can just wrap our heads around the idea that no doesn't mean never. Right. It just means no at this moment. And the times that you fall down, the times that you're rejected, the times that you fail are just learning experiences and yep. they will make you stronger. They really will. If you can embrace them, embrace them and see them for what they are as they are the building blocks that you're going to be standing upon in the years to come. If you think about the rejection letters that you two got and that Chance got and, you know, the Beatles even, I mean, you can't live off what somebody says to you or thinks about you. If you believe in yourself, you just try it again. That's what Ed Sheeran's point was, is that you just go out, 
even if it didn't go great, even if there's five people there, you keep doing it. And if somebody thinks that, hey, I want to get into the business and I'll just kind of show up and or my dad knows somebody, you're not going to be successful because you're going to get still get judged by how hard you work and your passion. And do you bring anything new? Do you have a perspective? Do you have a sense of what is coming that's new and exciting? Then somebody is interested in, in working with you. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Now, the flip side, Jeff, or I I shouldn't even say the flip side, any job, any career has aspects that are really tough. So what is the part of your current job that sucks the most? Telling somebody that the record they just worked on for two years doesn't have a successful song on it. Mm. A friend of mine who's a well-known producer says, if you want me to tell you the truth about your record, don't give it to me in plastic. So then obviously meaning that if it's done, and it's wrapped up and it's been shipped, say, hey, what do you think of my record? Wrong time to ask. That is not the time. If you're in the studio and you're in the process, you have a chance to say something. But I can't tell you how many times where you'd have to say, well, what do you think of our new music? What do you think of our record? And you have to struggle to find something positive to say, even though what you might have heard is a disaster. Mm. You know, and you listen to it, you say, this is self-indulgent and it's going to be a commercial disaster. Now, as we talked earlier about people skills, that is perhaps not what you're going to say to an artist who's devoted several years on a project, but you just look for something positive to say and depending on your relationship with the artist is how candid you can be but the hardest thing has always been to hear something and realize that what you're hearing is is not going to be successful for that artist yeah totally imagine why that would suck yeah. so three final espresso shots what is the best career advice you've ever gotten, Jeff? That's an interesting one. I don't know that I got advice from someone as much as watched examples of people doing things right and doing things wrong. It was less somebody saying, you know what you really ought to do in this situation? You should do this. That didn't happen that often in my life, but I really watched people who were successful and people who made big mistakes and tried to really learn from that. You have to be less self-involved. You have to be conscious of people and where they're coming from and what they might be interested in seeing happen in a discussion that you're having. Always being conscious of the fact that you wanted to walk out of there successful and so did the other person. So that it doesn't really help you if you have cleverly won a particular point and soured a relationship. No one ever told me not to burn bridges not to write nasty emails that I couldn't retrieve. I learned that from other people doing it, either to me or other people. So I think that I would say to somebody, the most important advice is that person that you're extremely unhappy with right now, or you're mad at, you might be working with five years down the road. So careful in expressing anger especially in writing. My advice to everybody is is never put anything in an email you don't want to see on the Washington Post front page. And if you live by that, then you're much happier. Fantastic advice. Thank you. So what movies, if any, or documentary films or books do you think accurately depict this profession? I just read a new book, which I really liked, called Daisy Jones and the Six, which maybe you've read, Andrea, but it's 
a new book in the last year, which is about a Fleetwood Mac type of band and how they wrote together and how they came together. And I really liked the creative process that was described in that book called Daisy Jones and the Six. I thought Bohemian Rhapsody was a wonderful film and loved watching the process, as did everybody, of the scene where they're creating Bohemian Rhapsody, the song, because you witness what sometimes happens in a studio, things that are really well rehearsed, and then the accidents, the happy accidents that, that go on when you're making a song that's as colossal as that. So I would say that that felt very realistic to me in terms of, of depicting that particular exciting moment of creativity. I'm trying to think of other things that there aren't a lot of things. Obviously, Spinal Tap is a film that people reference. Mm -hmm. And the embarrassing things that happen in that film still happen today. The posing and the, you know, the posturing and the excessive volume. That, that film was so close when it came out, and still people reference it today, is so close to reality that people were embarrassed watching it. I mean, the fact that the wives ended up managing the guys happens all the time, all the time. And it still happens. And there's a lot of things that Rob portrayed in that film that, and especially the most idiotic part, is still true. But things are obviously a lot more professional than they were then. But if you want to see parts of that film, it, it, it is still accurate, especially... <laughs> There's a scene in that, I'm sure you've seen the film where the, I think it's the bass player gets stuck in one of their pods. And I saw that it happened with a mega superstar band where they had this huge thing and it didn't open. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, oh my God, is there anything in Spinal Tap that still doesn't happen? Oh, that is so funny. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure to include the book and the movies in our show notes for our listeners. Thanks, Jeff. Final sure. espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your business? Hmm. About my business. How random things are when history is on the line. When we did Live 8, which was July, and Bono was involved with... Coldplay, and it was the debt relief show. We were told that we had 10 weeks to go and to build the entire show. And it was such a short period of time that we were totally flying blind most of the time. I mean, Live Aid, Live Aid the original one that everybody knows now from Queen, also came together very fast. So there are some things that are momentous in music history. Monterey Pop happened quickly. Some of these things that everybody knows are not that well planned. They're a little random how they can come together. But otherwise, it's a very, very professional, very highly organized business. But sometimes these mega events come together in an odd way. I mean, Pink Floyd played the Live 8 show they decided the night before they were going to do it. So I think people would be surprised at how systematic most of the business is and how well-planned it is, and then how random things can happen. Who would have thought Billie Eilish would be a superstar a year and a half ago? How does anybody figure that out? I mean, I heard a record. I thought it was great. I put her on Delta because I thought she was really cool. But if you said, is she going to be one of the biggest artists in the world in 2020? I would have said, no chance. How about Lizzo? Oh, yeah. You, you describe a woman with her background, obviously incredibly talented, super smart, but she embraces who she is. And she's a great role model and, and yet doesn't fit the usual prescription. She's well, not a size two. <laughs> no, she's not a size two. And God bless her for that. It's not like a lot of the guys that were around years ago were particularly good looking guys. There were guys and they got successful and they probably looked better after they got successful. There is an incredible amount of luck and smart people behind a success and then just some randomness. 
maybe that would surprise people, but it always surprises me when something that I don't expect happens. Well, that is really good to know because I think for the spectators, those of us who watched it on TV or who'd be there in person, we would never have known. Jeff, thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. You have such a cool job and I think that there are probably many, many, many people out there that would switch places with you in a heartbeat. Thank you. I appreciate it. I feel lucky. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.